Oh, good afternoon. Thank you. I'll just going to do a quick concussion 101. I want to really display some myths. Just talk about what's happening at the moment and where things are going. A lot of our um, big emphasis is coming from sport, so there's quite a bit of focus within the first part of this presentation about sport and where, where sports pushed it. Um, I just want to push home, concussion is a brain injury. It has its own little spectrum. We don't isolate concussion as a separate thing, concussion is a brain injury. It is a complex pathological process. There's a lot of, um, it's a mainly a functional disorder. Um, we are seeing some significant um, recoveries, but the presentations are so varied, and the recovery um, duration is so varied. Um, it is predominantly a deceleration accident. You don't have to be knocked out, and you don't have to have direct force to the head. And if we can remember those three things, that concussion is a brain injury, it's a deceleration accident, and you don't have to be KO'd, my life is a lot easier. Um, because what we want to be able to do is just talk through the presentations that we get later in this talk about the presentations to ED and the problems that we see. Um, a vast proportion of these patients look okay. Their face, or the end of bedogram, they look okay. It's only when you dig do you realise how big the holes are, especially with some of the, the moderate traumas. You can have a conversation, they can be GCS 15, but you'll dig a little bit further and you will find huge holes. And that's where we've got to start with some of our work. Um, predominantly, um, we work with our assessment through a functional assessment and we're um, and going through. We don't, um, we're still wary that they're GCS 15. We will be seating them if they've had a massive deceleration accident anyway, but we will very rarely um, have any, or we don't have any radiological evidence on CT of concussion and you don't see it on a standard MRI. You will see it on a functional MRI, but that research is still ongoing as is the biomarker uh, research that's currently in the States with the um, American football. Um, it's very early on, we've not seen huge amounts from it. Um, so from that perspective, it all falls back to decent quality cog screening. Um, for the sports people, it's, it started as a baseline and worked through on their impacts. But for us, it's starting in for refresh. So that gives us a little bit of a disadvantage because we don't know their normal baseline. ACC are currently putting a huge strategy together. This is on the back, um, essentially, of the sports concussion world that's going on. That, with the ACC protocol, is currently looking both at minor, moderate, and severe TBI management, and incorporated, incorporated that was the, is the, the concussion outpatient service that's currently being set up. It was set up about eight years ago, and it's on its about third revision of, um, of care delivery. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. But predominantly, most of this work has come back from um, the Zurich work and the Berlin work that's been done with the sports communities. Berlin was only a couple of weeks ago. Um, there's a big concern um, in terms of re professional sports people now getting to a retiring age and developing significant issues. Um, from our perspective, it's really raised the bar. They've got an ongoing surveillance programme, but that surveillance programme is now even starting down with this, their youth programmes and they're limiting their activities with their youth programmes. And that is quite interesting, especially in the South Auckland population where we've got youths, if they get it right and they make an NRL contract, there's a significant financial gain for them and their family and they're being pushed. And some of the little boundaries where we'd normally stop, the family is still pushing. So we're, we're having to work with that, a lot of the, the local area, um, agencies in order to be able to avoid that one. Um, the fourth um, edition is where most of the paperwork are running at the moment. The fifth has just been, uh, uh, meetings just gone on and we are anticipating to see that document in January. Um, but professional support's one thing. They've got a really geared up system. They've got a sports physician, they've got physios. But that's not what we're gonna see. That's not very typically the type of presentation we see. What we see is the amateur player. What we do know from the statistics that have come out is that female rugby players are higher risk than male rugby players. But these are typically the patients that we're gonna see in the sporting context. But more importantly, we're gonna see the trauma patient, which I'm gonna come back to. Um, the sports guideline has been really, really good, but I want to really poo the number of data that they're coming up with because they're estimating there's 35,000 sports-related head injuries in New Zealand. That was before the decent screening programs have taken on, so we're expecting that that number is going to rise because there is a group of patients that have fallen under the radar, both from a surveillance perspective and they're not seeking help. 
The sad thing is that between 2009 and 2013, that was 76 million New Zealand <coughs> health dollars spent. And that's a significant outlay that we're working through. Um, they've put a huge amount of effort in. Um, they're looking at putting a lot of work in for recognising through the grades, education plans with the schools, education plans with the schools, uh, with the sports coaches and with the families, and then having that package available. Unfortunately, the referring to the healthcare professionals document hasn't yet been published, and we're, not, we're expecting that that's going to cause us a bit of grief. Because um, one of the problems that we've got um, is that the GP funding to screen for concussion is a 25-minute period and the GP college have recognised that their screening tools they want to use is a 35-minute tool. So there is a deficit that we're going to have to work through. Um, this is just a bit of consideration, and, and this is a rugby union trauma um, recognition of concussion. I think, yet again, we've got to look at the data and go, actually, it's nice, the numbers are good, but there are some significant things to think about. Our surveillance in rugby union started about here, so we're bound to see an increase in, in presentations. But what's more scary is the scrum, scrummage rules and the rooking rules have changed, so our contacts have changed, and yet again, we've still got, a, uh, we've still got an increase in presentations. So there are problems, and we are going to see more. Um, one of the last sports slides, Northland trialled, so that the referee is now in control in amateur games to, to blue card and essentially suspend a player from playing a game. The great thing with the blue card system is that they've got to go to a designated healthcare professional to be screened fit to play again. And if they've been blue carded and they play without that, the team loses about 25 points, which is a, a significant amount within the championship. So it's in the team's interest to make sure the player's cleared. So it's a really good initiative that was trialled in Northland and that's running through school grades in Auckland as of next year. Um, but Rugby Union's one aspect, interestingly Rugby League sees less presentations but their players take longer to fix. Uh, but what's, and I'm going to ignore the boxing component, but the bit that frightens me the most is horse racing has the highest amount of presentations. And we have quite a lot of horse riders. And that's both, um, and they, this is only sports related, so I dread to think how many social riders we've got as well. Um, so is this the tip of the iceberg? It may well be. It may well be that these patients have a bad week and that suddenly within the next seven days they've fallen off the horse, they're not brilliant, and the world gets a better place. But what I can say is that some of the presentations that we've seen with our trauma patients, you know, this can go on for three months. Their headache can go on for three months. Their, um, their problems in concentration can cause go on for three months. And if you get into the behavioural problems or the emotional problems, that's, we've seen significant implications for Farno as well. Um, so who do we assess and when and why? You know, do we just look at the systematic patients or do we go and have a specific criteria and look, have a systematic approach? On the wards with our trauma patients, that's where we've gone. We're going any deceleration accident gets a screen. We've put a flowchart in so that we're screening every patient. And depending on their CT, depends on whether they get an active screen or it's just a simple yes, no screen. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more later. And then what? What do we do? Well, for us, if you'd seen this at the Olympics and you'd gone, yep, yeah, that's a fairly hideous accident at speed, she was out of hospital within 48 hours and was followed up by the team. But how many of our Sunday cyclists going through Clevedon does that happen with? They come off with a bit of a gravel rash and they come off with a clavicle fracture. I can tell you that that accident was one of the first patients that I screened and saw, and it took him, he was a CEO from a, a large building company in, um, in New Zealand, he was off work for three months, and it wasn't his clavicle that was the problem, it was his simple functioning issues with day-to-day -day work that was the problem. I went on the uh, American Association for uh, Neurology to look up symptoms, and I stopped when I got to that far, and there's two more slides if I really wanted to. What I want to do on my next bit of take-homes is predominantly these patients will have a headache, but when we put that into a trauma patient, there's a lot of other reasons why they could have a headache. You know, we often, if you talk to them, they go, I just feel as if I don't feel right, I feel as if I'm in a fog. How many of our patients are on tramadol? So we've got an added difficulty with the inpatient to think, is this pharmacological or is this something else? And we have to work through that. They often will talk about difficulty in concentrating, and one of the things I use with the youths is to find out how they're texting. Are they having problems texting? Because if they're having problems texting, it's a first world issue that we need to deal with. Um, and then I've got the big alarm bells if 
they've got the pillow over, uh, they've got the sheets over their head and they don't like the noise and the TV's annoying them because that's yet again another big alarm bell for us. But we're repetitive, um, we're, we're frequently seeing that and we've got to work out is that youth or is that a problem and it is just a matter of having a bigger picture and a, and a step back on it. One of the interesting things that we, we see is the repetitive movements and thoughts. You'll see that through the notes in a lot of our ED patients and that settles often quite quickly within the first couple of hours but they've then retrained themselves within the memory component to know that they're actually in hospital and they've had an accident and that Stacey's a nurse because it says she's a nurse um, so technically they're GCS15, aren't they? Because they've told us that they're orientated, but they could have still have a significant concussion. Um, in sport, they're using the SCAT3 tool. That's going to go by the end of the year. Um, it's going to get um, slightly worked with. The sports people are using ECOG screens. Uh, it's a computer-based screening program. Quite expensive, not practical for the DHBs, but the sports teams use it significantly um, and uh, quite a lot with all their patients through the, uh, players through the year just to see where they're going. For us, we use three screens predominantly, um, and we have a couple of backup tools. We use the abbreviated Westmead, which is a, a memory test of um, your GCS plus a few um, short-term memory questions, and we come back an hour later and see where we are. That's very much a yes-no tool. Uh, it was developed um, in Sydney as a uh, safe-to-discharge um, situation. Um, New South Wales have modified it a little bit further and added some more components into it. It's quite a reliable tool, but you only have to remember things for an hour. So it, is, it, is, it does have its issues. For our um, patients where we, we're concerned they've got a significant concussion, they've or got a CT positive for a bleed, or they've had a cervical spine uh, fracture, they get the full Westmead before we start. This strategy might change slightly in the year because we're, we're while we're working with ACC, uh, standardising the protocols through the DHBs. Um, the Westmead tool takes three days to run, so we've got to be quick at getting it started. Um, it can be a problem, but predominantly it identifies our, our major patients. If you look in the context of major trauma, the patients are going to be in for more than three days, so it's not an issue. It's when we're using it for the clearing where the patients have got a little sub um, or we're, we're not quite sure with them, that's where it can become a little bit problematic and registrars get a bit grumbly because it's taking forever. But I think we need to be systematic with it. The other thing that we use is the Rivermead, and the Rivermead is purely symptom-based. But yet again, once you've been in hospital for a couple of days and you're sleep-deprived and you're sore, um, your Rivermead scores can be massive. So for us, it's a trajectory. Are things improving? Where are we with it? And then we've got a backup tool of either using the Mocha or the UK far preferred that we use the Acer. Um, we very rarely convert to those. We've normally had an issue with our full Westmead if that's been the case. Um, there are limitations. There's definitely limitations with them. Um, patient accessibility is a big thing. We, we time to access the patient at the right time. We never, we never screen in ICU um, and we only ever screen in the wards, but we still have issues. Um, there is a bit of an itrogenic hangover and we do, so we have to be patent for that. Tramadol does cause us a huge amount of grief. Um, and similarly, being in a hospital does sort of kind of often muddle the affair in a couple of directions. And some people actually like hospital food and want to stay, which causes me no end of grief. Um, so then what? If we've done the tools in ED and we've decided to admit, that's fine. We then need to see that we're going to put them into a safe discharge environment. Um, do they need to have rehab? Is that rehab going to have to be as an inpatient because they're at the severe end, or is it can we do it as a community component and we can get them followed up within a couple of days? Or can we hope that the community component can pick them up in a week's time and check that the world is a good place? And that is often a, uh, a yardstick for us. Um, and we all, or do we just go with a, do you want to see how you're doing? You can go and see your GP. If you've got a problem, go and see them. How often will that work in the South Auckland population? because um, it isn't and it doesn't because we struggle with that so we have to build in a safety little mechanism but the key thing within the rehab is rest and it's both physical and mental and and sharing that mental model with the family and with the patient and reiterating it is our big is our biggest hurdle but our biggest success and we need to um, ironically put that into what that rest looks like at home it looks like at work but more importantly what it looks like day to day that the smartphone needs to be left in the drawer switched off the TV is rationed, the radio is rationed, and rest periods initiated. And that sounds very pedantic, but it's the one thing that makes a huge difference towards the recovery. Because we know if we leave it longer, um, and they try and do too much, we have issues. 
Um, we also need to introduce injury uh, insight. You know, we've, we've currently discharged a chappy to inpatient rehab over the week. Um, it was the big lottery last week. He thought he'd get a lottery ticket. He thought it'd be a good idea to try and make it to the dairy. He got as far as the end of the ward and then didn't feel very well. So it's just reiterating that home on what this looks like. Um, and once we've got past the safe discharge environment, it's then creating what, what symptom management do they need, what coping strategies do they need, and what support they need. Because yet again, they look normal. They look like Murray at the moment. You know, they look good, but the reality is there's something wrong. <laughs> no, I'll briefly talk about um, uh, the, the, the Berlin meeting. Um, SCAT 3 is going, SCAT 4 is going to come in. They're going to look at uh, looking more at the vestibular issues and balance issues because the assessment they think is so, uh, so suboptimal. They're also looking in the sports component and the active rehab. You know, certain codes have got certain time frames post to concussion and when they re return to sport and they return to impact. And they're looking at improving that because there's quite a large lag between each code. Um, but I think that uh, some of that lag is appropriate because they're also putting it as age, age related and they're protecting, protecting their youths a lot more. Um, interestingly, the American Football Association, so soccer, are um, under 15s are no longer able to head the ball as a part of a preventative strategy because they're trying to reduce their concussion that way. Um, there is a lot of research going on and we need, a lot, or we need some decent research on the long-term effects of concussion. What we do know is secondary impact concussion is devastating and the impact for recovery is massive. Um, so we, that's why we're trying to get it right, especially with our active rehab component. And there are some also interesting little things happening. You can buy um, a scrum cap g accelerator ometer or free book. Um, but obviously, um, University of Otago have been running that research um, with this little marker here for about a year. Um, this is quite scary. He had a 300G hit in the North Harbour game. He averaged 15 hits over 60G. And I go, that's quite scary. Um, and then I then looked back at the data that we were sent, and they had 120 hits measurable above 2G. So that's quite a lot of impacts on them. And I go, that's quite a lot. He's a front rower, that's fine. But the same people had done a research trial looking at under 12s rugby in South Auckland. And they, hit, they had two 18G hits and were frequently seeing above 14G hits in 12-year-olds. That is just, doesn't bear thinking about for me in terms of that unprotected brain. So we're going to talk about, we've, we've talked about screening tools. They're going to evolve. I think we've got quite a nice balance with what we're doing within the DHB. But the biggest problem we have is education both from the staff perspective on what the perception is and also on the staff education and getting it done early or inappropriately. Thank you.